Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 stress and vaccine hesitancy discussion brought to you by the U.S. Haitian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to have a moment of silence for all of those who have lost loved ones to COVID or have been adversely impact impacted by the pandemic in any way, um, as well as the families in Haiti who've endured losses during the traumatic past few months with the earthquake and political turmoil. Stay with me, please. Thank you for that. And uh, so just to uh, continue on that, on that nature, uh, to quote from Isaiah verse 41, chapter 10. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Uh, now, first off, I'd like to start off by thanking our audience in attendance. We really encourage and appreciate the participation and support of our community. Uh, you could have been doing a lot of other things tonight. So as a token of our gratitude, uh, there will be a prize given at the end of discussion for the best question. So uh, think of good questions and ask good questions. Uh, we at the chamber are truly committed to empowerment and growth and unity by any means and all means. We have primarily dedicated a lot of energy to support local minority owned businesses uh, with different engagements and resources to help them stay afloat in these times and to thrive if possible. And we are working to create a more national footprint as well. However, the issues impacting the community can be complicated and widespread. So we are always adapting to the times to ensure we are consistently adding value to the culture. In fact, we have recently partnered with the town of Randolph to help support their vaccine outreach efforts and to get as many people vaccinated and protected as possible, and uh, especially in the Black community. And quickly, I just want to extend a special thanks for this to Councillor Ken Clifton and our President Hans Patrick Domusant for making this happen. So as I mentioned before, it is a very challenging time on many fronts uh, for the Haitian community specifically. Um, but there is no more resilient and determined group in the world. I am so I am so very naturally optimistic about the future of the Haitian population once we get the collective mindset on the same page. And anyone who disagrees, you could tell them to do their research on the history in the country. And then after they do it, tell them you're welcome that there isn't still slavery today because of the beautiful country of Haiti. So. Last thing I want to mention before I step aside and let our experts get to work. Um, I am not here to tell you what to do or how to think, but I have some really intelligent, intelligent individuals who are well educated in this field and want to provide you with facts to help you make better and more informed decisions about your health and well being. So without further ado, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce our brilliant and esteemed panel members for this pressing topic in front of us today. Uh, we have Dr. Gabrielle Abelard, who is a mental health clinician and a dedicated educator with over 20 years of experience working in mental health. She is the CEO of Abelard Psychotherapy Inc., a community mental health clinic in Stoughton and Dedham, Massachusetts and the Director of Psychiatric Mental Health, DNP, and post master Certificate Programs at UMass Amherst College of Nursing. She holds a Master's and a Bachelor's Degree in Nursing from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a Doctorate in Nursing, and a post master Certificate in Psychiatric Nursing from Regis College. Uh, Dr. Abelard trains hospitals, colleges, and organizations on a variety of topics, including mental health, suicide awareness, prevention, and team building, Restraint Reduction, Mental Health, and Telehealth. Dr. Abelard is a recipient of the 2019 Haitian Commerce Young Professional of the Year Award, which is uh, hosted by uh, the Chamber, uh, proud uh, alumni of the award ceremony, and uh, the 2020 American Psychiatric Nurses uh, New England Chapter Nancy Valentine Excellence in Leadership Award. She is also a current president of the Faculty Assembly and Treasury of APNA New England. Her mission is to increase diversity in healthcare and to help individuals reach their best selves through awareness and resiliency building. Uh, Dr. Adrienne Carter, it's a pleasure for me to introduce her as well. 
uh, is an internal medicine physician practicing outpatient internal medicine at UAB's Whitaker Clinic in Birmingham, Alabama. Her interests include management of hyperextension and diabetes. She has particular interest in promoting healthy lifestyle sense for uh, disease prevention. Uh, Dr. Crowder is a proud native of Birmingham, Alabama. She received her undergraduate degree in chemical engineering from the University of Alabama in Tallulah, Alabama. She received her medical degree from the University of Alabama of Medicine. Uh, she completed her internal medicine residency at Caraway Hospital, where she was chief medicine resident, and Dr. Crowder is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Uh, she is married with and a proud mother of three sons, and her hobbies include spending time with her husband and sons doing yoga and running, as if she's not busy enough already. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way. Dr. Abelard is going to do her slideshow and then followed by uh, Dr. Adrian as well. And I will step aside and let you guys do what you do. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Anthony, thank you so much for that nice welcome. I'm pleased to be here with the chamber and also with my colleague, Dr. Adrian Carter. I think Anthony said it best in that, you know, we're not really here to try to change anyone's mind, but hopefully by the time you leave here at the end of the night, you'll walk away with some new information or with a new way of reflecting on the information that you'll hear. And so we're here to have this virtual conversation with you today on stress and vaccine hesitancy. So I would love to launch a poll. We're gonna go ahead and try it. We're gonna to pray to the tech gods that we can get this poll up. But just wanna see you know, with our audience tonight, how many of you have been vaccinated? And so I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to launch this poll. And so if you can see the poll, I invite you to answer the poll. And if it doesn't launch, um, I want you to go ahead and respond. Now, Anthony, is the is the chat on so folks can say yes or no if they're comfortable? Um, and please, by any means, if you're not comfortable, we, we respect that. But if you want to share, you can go ahead. Um, but there's several different um, vaccines, uh, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna. Are you not vaccinated? Are you ambivalent about being vaccinated? Or you're not going to get the vaccine at all. So I did try to launch it. It doesn't appear that it's, it, it does appear that it is not working. Um, my colleague, Dr. Carter, who's going to go after me, is going to spend some time talking about the vaccine and COVID-19. So I invite you to save any questions you have until that section of our night. And so, um, Flashback. Looks like it did launch, Doctor. <laughs> it did launch. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll move on just for the sake of time, um, even though I did want to know that question. Um, so flashback, where were you a year and a half ago? I remember where I was. I was in my boardroom at the practice meeting with clinicians and, oh, it's going. Oh, okay, do you guys see the poll? Okay, all right, so it looks like the poll did launch, just rewind to my previous screen. I'm glad it was working. Um, on our end, for our panelists, it doesn't seem like it's working. But on the other end, in terms of responses, 50% vaccinated with Pfizer and the other 50% vaccinated with Moderna. Um, but I'm not sure how accurate it was because we stopped the poll. It looks like three out of six, three out of six. So it's total six respondents out of the 17. So that gives us some flavor of those who responded in terms of if they were vaccinated or not. So I began to reflect on where we were about a year and a half ago. Um, and I remember it was February and I was saying to clinicians at the practice, there is a virus and it's extremely concerning. However, there's no imminent threat in Massachusetts is what I said. And then what seemed to be less than four weeks later, it seemed like our whole world had changed um, in terms of our ability to go out and be in public and be with others. We suddenly had restrictions placed for our own protection in terms of trying to limit the spread of this in infection. And so what we know now is that there was a huge conference in the Boston area hosted by Biogen. It was an international conference. 
Um, and the members of this conference um, who attended began to become ill. And so they've been able to trace that worldwide over 330,000 cases of infections were spread from that one event. And so if you think of us being worldwide and states and cities, how many such events were happening and how fast was the, infec the infection spreading? A lot has happened. I don't think anybody could have told me almost a year, over a year and a half ago where we would be today, very different set of circumstances. And so before I get into what has happened, because I think before we can talk about what we can do about that, we need to understand where we've been. So I'd love to know about your level of stress. So here we go, we're going to try again and launch a poll. Let's see how this goes here. Okay, so you should all now see um, the poll that's asking about stress. So questions, are you very stressed? Are you not stressed? Are you somewhat stressed? Are you depressed? Not stressed at all, feeling wonderful? Or are you just good? How are you feeling? So we'll give a minute or two. Thank you all for participating. I see we're at eight out of 16. So I wanna invite the rest of you to continue participating in our poll, 10 out of 16. And we'll just give one more minute. So we're just around 68% in terms of responses. So anybody else, I invite you to go ahead and jump in. Okay, so it looks like we're at 12 out of 16 and majority um, somewhat stressed, 46%, very stressed, 15%, I'm good, 15%, and not stressed, wonderful, thank goodness for you, um, right around 15%. So really, I think split tonight in terms of how people are feeling and I'll share that just so that you all can have a visual of what that looks like. But the majority in terms of our guests um, on this evening, somewhat stressed at 46%. And so where have we been in this last year? Um, you know, I think based from experience of clients that I see in my outpatient mental health practice, it's really been a mixed bag. I think it's been really a roller coaster. You know, I think before we can talk about where we are today, we have to reflect on how much we've been through. You know, we've had an insurrection, we've had wildfires, we've had social justice marches, we've had financial crisis as a country, we've had back home in Haiti, we've had our own president assassinated. Most recently, we see symbols of our own countrymen being whipped um, by the seashore and many people looking for hope, for freedom and peace moving forward. So we've been through a lot. Um, we went from being in person, mostly seeing smiles and faces to seeing eyes and not being aware if someone is smiling or if someone is angry. Um, so as a country, we have been through a lot in terms of the impact of COVID-19 financially, if you think about your childhood and where you grew up or where you've been shopping and how things have gone for us financially, you know, during COVID, we've seen tremendous increase in how many companies have filed for five, um, chapter 560 filings. And that number was up over 20% from the previous year. So stores like True Religion, stores like Lord & Taylor, Neiman Marcus, J.C. Penney, all filing for Chapter 560. And never mind how many Black-owned businesses have been closed because of what we've seen happen during the pandemic. So financially, we've certainly have been hit hard. 
COVID-19 has absolutely been a traumatizing event. One of my clients, Jean Michel, I don't go anywhere. I stay in my house, Dr. Abloyd. I don't go, I don't wanna get sick. I don't wanna make anybody sick. I just stay in my house. COVID-19 has impacted the population in the country, over 42.5 million cases, over 600,000 deaths. The risk of contracting a disease itself has become a population-wide traumatizing event. I've coined the term FOC for fear of COVID. In fact, physical and social environments have changed as well, leading to greater rates of isolation, loneliness, financial hardship, housing and food insecurity, and worst of all, more interpersonal violence. COVID-19 has exacerbated and highlighted already existing inequities that have been in our society for a long period of time and just has amplified that to the next level. And we have found that, especially in our, our BIPOC community, that it has caused a worsened situation. Combine the pandemic, fear, inequality, and any of these factors by themselves can negatively affect our mental health but in combination, they have created a nationwide mental health crisis. So mindset, some more statistics just to be aware of. It is true that prior to COVID-19, I've seen it in my practice that mental health disorders weren't pri prioritized in the same way. One thing that I'll say about COVID-19 is we're talking a lot more about mental health in ways that we just didn't do that in the past. You have a lot more celebrities talking about it. You have a lot more families becoming cognizant of it. More than 61.2 million American adults had a mental illness and or a substance use disorder in 2019. A recent survey revealed that 40.9% of US adults reported at least one adverse mental or behavioral health condition since the start of the pandemic. Findings from an American Nurses Association survey found that 32,000 nurses, March through April of 2020, 87% feared going to work, while 36% cared for COVID positive patients without protective health equipment. The president of the American Nurses Association just announced um, his concern this week of the state of our healthcare system for our healthcare workers who are really tired and becoming more fearful with the growing numbers of COVID cases. Mental Health America, one thing I, I absolutely want to share is a website titled Mental Health America. Um, there are free mental health screens that are available. I put the URL on this slide. Um, it is a self-help web website where anyone can attend and answer a few questions. There's surveys about depression, uh, bipolar disorder, trauma, youth hopelessness. And from their findings during COVID-19, the statistics I think are growing and increasing because more people are going to this website. But in regards to depression, over eight in 10 people who took the depression screen scored with moderate to severe depression. In terms of loneliness, April through September, those who screen with moderate depression um, and or anxiety uh, reported that 70% of them contributed isolation and loneliness to reasons why they were feeling depressed and or anxious. Regarding hopelessness, 37% reported having increase in suicidal thinking. And of course, concerning is regarding our youth, over half of our 11 to 17 year olds reported having thoughts of suicide or self-harm with the highest groups being those individuals who identify as being LGBTQ. Um, one thing to say that has been very helpful is students going back to school. Um, we know that them being out of school has been really traumatic in terms of people's anxiety and feelings of loneliness and depression. So um, having uh, our youth in school has made a dramatic difference in terms of their overall health. So we are definitely living in a time like no other in our history. I mentioned FOC. Um, and that is impacted by fear, hopelessness, isolation, and mental health fatigue. More than one third of Americans say that the crisis has had a serious impact on their mental health. And I talked about the trauma. 
I think there's no family in America or anywhere in the world that hasn't been touched by COVID-19. Trauma is a deeply distressing, disturbing experience that results in a stress reaction. It can impact our mind, it can impact our body, but it's a whole physical and emotional health um, experience that can have deep impacting results on our health. I think Hans Seals said it best when he developed the stress adaptation theory and he discussed the difference between alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And when I think about what I see in my mental health clinic and people tell me, well, Dr. Abelard, I feel anxious, I feel depressed, I'm not sleeping, I'm overeating. And we find out that a lot of this does come from stress and how they're coping. We know that the World Health Organization has shared that about 80% of primary care visits are secondary to stress. So you think about those who are experiencing high blood pressure or those that are experiencing dizziness or having difficulty sleeping, where is that coming from? I know in our culture, we often refer to it as feeling découragé, but where does it come from and what do we do when we feel that way? Do we go and talk to someone? Do we seek support? What are the messages that we've received within our own home, within our own culture? Fear and stress. A 2021 study based on race, age, and gender found that 31% of adults um, stated they would not take the vaccine because of fear, safety, or perceived thought of a lack of effectiveness to the vaccine. And that data was uh, noted prior to vaccines being available. Another study, and this was done in Haiti um, in 2021, found that 22% of Haitians were open to getting the vaccine. What does that mean for the rest of the country? And when they dug a little bit deeper, what they learned is that there was a lot of concern and mistrust um, on why someone would go get the vaccine, where it was coming from, and what it could possibly um, cause. Oops, sorry about that. There is a correlation between a lack of perceived threat of the COVID-19 and false information being spread both on the internet and also due to a lack of access to testing and also treatment. Another study who looked at the Caribbean pub from by the Caribbean Public Health Agency found that 32 to 62 percent of adults in several Caribbean countries were skeptical of taking the vaccine. Another study found that ethnic minorities in the United Kingdom had significant amount of hes hesitancy in those who are interested. I share these statistics to share that in terms of being a person of color in this country or even US wide, there's reason to be skeptical. We know that historically there's been studies on people of color to see what the benefits or the risks have been of certain medications. We know that when Foreign entities have entered countries like, for example, Haiti. We know that shortly after UN occupancy, they were able to trace cholera back to having foreign influence in the country. So there are reasons why um, some of us are fearful to go and get vaccines. But we're here today to talk to you about reasons why you should also consider getting vaccines. And my colleague will talk more about that shortly. So the pandemic is here with no checkout date. How have you adapted? What is your mindset? So we learned that during the pandemic, some of us got more sleep, while others who have had pre-existing conditions were at higher risk for mental health issues. We also learned that 38% of us had an increase in meals consumed at home, which was good, especially when we weren't able to go out. Um, but what were those meals about? And were any of us binging? How many of us gained the COVID 15 pounds? I was one of them. Um, and a lot of that was due to a decrease in physical activity. We've also found there to be an increase in injuries, neck, shoulder, and eye injury. And those um, were experienced by many of us who went virtual. We also noted an increase in alcohol purchases. Um, back in March, when this particular study was done, they found 22 to 27% increase in alcohol consumption. I have a neighbor who owns a, 
liquor store and what she shared with me is during the height of the pandemic, her sales went up 100%. And so how did we cope as a society in terms of our access, in terms of um, how we dealt with stresses that we were faced with? So maladaptive coping skills, this is something I talk a lot about in my practice. Um, you know, what have we been doing? You know, have we been drinking wine, two glasses, 246 calories, caffeine, 278 calories, beer, 300 calories for two. And then most concerning, and especially with our youth, is the use of electronic cigarettes and nicotine. We know that hookahs, for example, are nine times more addictive than cigarettes within themselves. And so when we think about um, some of our coping skills and how we're managing through st stress, how is that really impacting us? I call almost all of these gut busters, sleep disruptors, and anxiety provokers. So if you've been having difficulty sleeping, if you've been having difficulty concentrating, if you've been gaining weight, we need to look at how you're coping. Insufficient sleep is a public health epidemic, CDC. So do you have a sleep disorder? Does your bed look like the bottom right of my screen? If your bed looks like this, I really wanna encourage you to fix this because this is a problem. I tell my clients, when you go to bed, we want you to have yummy, yummy sleep. That means nothing stressful in your bed when you go to bed. In fact, many of us, you know, our cell phone is closer to us than our partner. Where is your cell phone place? Get it out of your bed put it to the side. Are you having caffeine close to your bedtime? Because caffeine can drastically be impacting your sleep. So NIH, the National Institute of Health, recommends for adults that we should be sleeping anywhere from seven to eight hours a night. Our school-age children, nine hours. Our preschool and younger children, 10 to 12. And our newborn, 16 to 18. You know, what I find interesting is for those of us that are parents or those of us that have worked with young children, we put them on a sleep schedule. We're very focused on the time they go to bed and the time they wake up. And we do that because we know it helps us function. So why is it as, as adults, we think we can go without sleep when we work and manage children and manage bills and manage all of this. So that's a good question. We really need to remove the sleep disruptors and we need to work on our consistent sleep. We need to have a plan. And if we need to use dark therapy like myself, I um, mean, you can see the corner top right. These, this is what my nightstand looks like and what I need to do to make sure I get good sleep. Um, and so aromatherapy is helpful, planning your sleep. And there's a link here to a guide to healthy sleep as well. So look in the mirror. I'm asking you to start with yourself. If you want to work on resiliency and do everything you can to keep yourself healthier, you've got to start with yourself. When you look in the mirror and you decide to wash your face, do you wash the mirror? Question again. When you look in the mirror and you decide to wash your face, do you wash the mirror? The answer is no. We need to learn how to fix ourselves, not what we see deep, right? Incentive for change, and I'll go through this quickly because I definitely want to have my uh, colleague talk to you a little bit here. But incentive for change, what we've learned during the pandemic is certainly when we're not getting outside, not getting sunlight, not getting exercise, that we see the impact on our body. So this is like a visual. If we stayed sedentary, what would we look like in a few years? So because of a lack of a vitamin D, we would see thinning under our eyes. And so people begin to get black marks under their eyes. Because some of us are in front of the computer and we don't take breaks, we develop, we start to become hump after a while. And some of us get issues with our, our wrist and our necks from the pain of sitting still and idle. And then of course, with lack of vitamin D, we face risk for hair loss. And so those are just some incentives to make changes around how you take care of yourself. Other coping tips to manage stress. Don't watch too much television. Share fears with others. Connect with others. Remember the study that I talked about, a big part of the depression and anxiety felt by many was a feeling of social isolation. We need to connect with each other and be with each other in order to be well. 
The Japanese call it forest bathing. That's the act of going outside and being amongst trees and taking walks. There was a study published in Nature that found that being outside, breathing fresh air and being amongst trees um, resulted in an increase in energy, motivation, and just general well-being. The other thing I like to recommend is using your shower as a place of meditation because that is one of the few places we do not bring our phones. It's one of the few places we can actually be with ourselves. Use that as a point of relaxation and reflection. If you are in front of the computer, take breaks. If you are in front of a Zoom, use a speaker view and do not use a gallery view because a speaker view can be, the non-speaker view can be very taxing in terms of overstimulation. Use an expandable desk, have a positive outlook, adopt a mantra. And lastly, I'm gonna share, use the text hotline. If you have your phone, save this number. You may find that you may have a friend in crisis who needs support or you yourself might need support, especially for our young folks who like and enjoy texting. Um, this is an option for them too, should they ever need extra support as a text hotline. And then I just wanna skip ahead to my last slide before Dr. Carter is introduced. And what you see here on my slide is a picture of Our Lady of Assumption um, in Haiti both before the 2010 earthquake and after the 2010 earthquake. And I share this with you because we know that prayer is a big part of our culture. And we know that we are resilient. We think of our coat of armor, which means in unity, there is strength. And what I share with you today is that it is very hard to succeed in life by yourself that we need to be in tune with what we need to do to take good self-care. And by doing that, we really raise the bar in building our own mental health resiliency. For those of us who were born and raised in Haiti or no family in Haiti, we keep all in prayer, but we say that we are resilient we are resilient and we work together as a nation through strength and unity. I thank you for your time. Um, I wanna pass it on to my doc, uh, my colleague, Dr. Adrian Carter. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and allow her to take over the screen. Thank you. Right, as uh, Dr. Carter sets up her slides and gets ready, just wanted to uh, give a special thanks to all of our listeners and all of our audience uh, we have uh, over hundreds of people viewing on Facebook right now. Just wanted to quickly say thank you very much for participating and continue. It's getting going to get much better. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, U.S. US uh, Haitian Chamber for inviting me to speak to you today and having this very important event to talk about COVID, COVID uh, virus and vaccine hesitancy. I want to thank Dr. Abelard and Anthony Florival for inviting me as well. And I'm just going to go on and get started because I got a lot of information to get through here. Okay. Sorry. Here, um, I uh, my name is Dr. Adrian Carter. I am an internal medicine physician at UAB in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a primary care physician, and I'm going to come to you from the standpoint of a primary care physician. The things that I'm seeing in the office, and what to expect with the vaccination, and what to expect with uh, COVID-19. So we're going to talk a little bit about the virus, what it is, who gets it most. What are its effects? What to do if you contract it, if you get infected? How to prevent treatments, vaccination in the future? So we got a lot to go through here today. So um, COVID-19 is a coronavirus and the nature of the virus is it's got a spherical shape and it has these proteins all around it. And that's why they call it corona, coronavirus, coronaviruses. There are several coronaviruses that impact humans that usually cause respiratory infections, including the common cold. You may remember um, about a decade ago, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome um, came about and we thought that that may be the next global pandemic. Also, 
Uh, SARS came along, it impacted some Middle Eastern and Asian communities, but never really had, was a big player in America. But um, it was also thought to possibly cause a global pandemic at that time, but never fully developed. Um, so the full name of COVID-19, we call it COVID-19, but its real name is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. SARS-CoV-2, and it's called COVID-19 because it was discovered in 2019. So who gets it most? Um, there are certain clinical conditions that we see, people that have uh, any kind of chronic illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, lung disease, um, and even obesity actually contract the virus more than others. Um, people with Down syndrome, people that are um, have ongoing cancer diagnosis, sickle cell, people that smoke, they also um, get the virus more often. There are certain socioeconomic factors. So people, um, so a lot of times when people are in a lower socioeconomic status, they tend to live um, in more multi-generational households. Um, they tend to uh, not be able to isolate as much. They work more in the public sphere. So they're a little bit more apt to uh, getting uh, this type of a virus. Uh, people in pregnancy, pregnant women are more susceptible to COVID-19 infection. Um, so how can it affect you? Most people are gonna be asymptomatic. And that's part of the problem with COVID-19 is that you may be passing it along to others unaware because you don't have a, have symptoms. A third of the people infected have no symptoms. Most people have acute respiratory illness. 87 to 98% of people have fever. You can have cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, fatigue, upper respiratory type symptoms. Or what I hear most is people saying, I think I have a sinus infection. Can you call me in a Z-pack? Well, no, that's COVID, you know, until proven otherwise. Some people will present with just kind of like a bile gastroenteritis type symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So they think that they have a stomach virus. Well, that also could be COVID-19. Some people will have a loss of taste and smell. Some patients will have some more rare things, um, rashes and neurological symptoms. So the first seven to 10 days is when we see kind of more respiratory type symptoms, but as COVID-19, and most people will, um, their immune system will take over and the infection will resolve with no problems. But some people progress to have an, um, a multi, um, a whole body inflammatory process happen. Right. And these are the people that get sicker. Right. They end up with bilateral pneumonia. They can be admitted with multi organ failure, um, may have to um, be uh, put on a ventilator. They can have um, kidney failure, liver failure. These are the things that that can happen as COVID-19 progress. And even once the infection is completely resolved, some people are what they call long, long time COVID people. So long haulers. People can have fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, loss of taste and smell that can last three to 12 weeks. I have patients that are still complaining about increased headache, about um, increased cough, six months after infection with COVID. So what do you wanna do if you get it? First of all, you wanna get tested. So like I said, I'm, I'm gonna talk about a lot of different things because there's, gonna, there's a lot of questions and a lot of myths out there about COVID. So one of those things is about getting tested. So there's several ways that you can get tested. Um, you can get the rapid antigen. And now it's pretty easy to go get a rapid test. You can even go to your local um, drug store and get a rapid test and test yourself at home. These type tests are, are they're accurate, but not as accurate as the gold standard, which is the PCR test. The, PC, the rapid test, you can get your results within the hour. The PCR test would generally take 
24 to 48 hours. So if you have a rapid test that's positive, be sure that you do have COVID. There's no reason to retest tomorrow. You have COVID. If you have a PCR that's positive, please feel sure that you have COVID, no need to retest tomorrow. And at that point, you need to isolate from family, friends, and coworkers. Um, so we got some new guidelines that are out uh, for primary care physicians like myself to tell patients what to do if they find out that they are infected. Now, you are patient, you may be a patient, but you may not, you're not my patient. So each one of you have a different set of medical issues. So you need to talk, talk to your primary care physician if these things come up, but I do like to give some guidelines to people. So first of all, you want to monitor your blood pressure and oxygen levels at home. Um, one of the key recommendations is checking your oxygen levels at home. And I want to um, suggest that each one of you get a, a home blood pressure monitor, automated blood pressure monitor, and also get an O2 sat monitor. And um, I have one here so you can see what I'm talking about. It's one of these little things that go on your finger. You can get it for about 25 to 30 bucks at your local pharmacy, at, at Walmart, on Amazon. Having these at home is vital because this is going to let you know when it's time to go to the hospital. So the current recommendations are for people who are infected with COVID-19 to check their oxygen levels at least three times a day. If the oxygen levels fall below 92%, notify your doctor because that, that's an indicator, a prime indicator that you may need supplemental oxygen. Okay, you want to hydrate with water. We always tell you that when you're sick with any kind of virus, you want to make sure you stay hydrated because some of some of the problems that occur with um, viruses like the flu and even COVID-19 is dehydration. So you want to make sure you're drinking half of your body weight in ounces each day. You want to rest and sleep in the prone position. They've done studies on this and they found that people actually do better when they're sleeping on their side or their belly when they have COVID-19. So this keeps the mucus from pooling in the, um, in, in the bottom of your lungs. So you wanna continue to cough forcefully and take deep breaths, hold them as long as possible. You wanna continue physical activity. This is not the time to lay in the bed if at all possible. Now, if you get out that bed and your heart rate is going up above 130, lay back down. But we do recommend moderate physical activity as tolerated. First and foremost, before you do anything, you get tested, you're positive, call your primary care physician and let them know because there are some treatments that are available and time is of the essence. You want to treat, and like I said, again, if you got other chronic medical conditions, you may you need to talk to your physician about some of these recommendations, but these are some of the national guidelines. You can use certain things to treat symptoms. Mucinex, over-the-counter mucinex, um, can be used to kind of break up some of the congested mucus so you can get it out. Zyrtec will help with some of those sinus, those congestion symptoms that you have. Aspirin is optional, um, but that's something that um, is recommended as a possible blood thinner. Your physician may prescribe a budesonide nebulizer that will help with some of the shortness of breath symptoms and help you continue to take deep breaths. Zofran can be used, and that, again, is prescribed by your primary care physician as needed for nausea and vomiting. Em Emodium is, need is uh, used as needed for diarrhea if you have those symptoms. And lastly, consider monoclonal antibody treatment. So we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, so what do you want to do? What do you not want to do if you get it? Um, Oral steroids, please do not call your primary care doctor and ask for a Medrol dose pack and a Z-pack. You know, we've actually found that people do worse if they get oral steroids within the first six days, unless oxygen is re required for COVID-19. So please, you do not need steroids. Ivermectin, please give that horse back its parasite treatment. 
Ivermectin is not effective for COVID-19. Again, antibiotics are not, is a virus. Antibiotics do, do not help viruses. Um, hydroxychloroquine, there was some studies early on and people started using hydrochlor uh, hydroxychloroquine, which is sometimes used for lupus and other connective tissue diseases, but it is it's found to not be effective for COVID-19. Also, multivitamins and supplements, may abuse, even though they may boost your immune system, are not a treatment. So uh, monoclonal antibody therapy, I do want to tell you guys about it because it's very important. You want to call your primary care physician as early as possible because these um, um, antibody treat therapies can help prevent you from further progressing in um, COVID-19 infection. They're given early to reduce the risk of severe disease. And you and they want to and you want to give it um, like I said within ten days of symptom onset. And we generally will give it to people that have chronic medical conditions, uh, greater than sixty five, um, are obese. So these people are at the highest risk of having severe disease with COVID nineteen. It is given um, in doctors' offices. It can be given sub Q or by infusion. But you need to um, let your primary care physician know about this. This is basically giving you the antibodies to COVID-19 to help you fight the infection. So, so now all this I said to talk up to you about the vaccine. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that is what I'm about in primary care. So first thing you want to do, you want to stay healthy, continue your cardiovascular exercise. You want to eat healthy meals, avoid smoking, socially distancing, wearing your mask, cleaning your hands, those things are still vital even in the time of vaccination to help keep you healthy and keep you from getting COVID-19 infection. Vaccination. So what is a vaccine? Vaccine is a biological product that can be used to safely induce an immune response that gives protection against infection and or disease on repeat exposures to a pathogen. So it's a way to train your immune system to provide you with protection from an illness without giving you the infection itself. So um, there are three um, uh, FDA approved um, vaccines for COVID-19. Pfizer vaccine is fully approved. Its name is, com I don't know how to say it, Comirnaty. Um, we just call it the Pfizer vaccine. It's 95% effective at preventing cases of COVID-19. It's an mRNA type vaccine. Um, it's, it can be given to people 12 years old and older, two day dose regimen with a 21 day interval in between. It has no preservatives, no eggs, no latex or metals. Most people um, may get local site reactions. So your arm may get a little sore at the site. Um, some people will have fatigue, low-grade fever, achiness, maybe even like a little flu-like illness, but that usually will resolve within 24 to 48 hours. So, and um, the, the uh, next um, mRNA-type vaccine is the Moderna vaccine. It's highly effective as well. Um, it is for 18 and older, two-dose regimen with a 28-day interval. It has no preservatives, very similar side effect profile. The last is the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine. It's highly effective as well. It uses a slightly different mechanism, an adenovirus vector vaccine. It's for 18 years and older. Beautiful thing about the Johnson & Johnson is a one-dose regimen, um, and it has very similar side effects. So the facts. COVID-19 vaccines will not give you COVID. Um, people have normal side effects. And this is these, this febrile type um, symptoms that people have is simply the body's immune system turning on. You know, that's, that's how you need to think about it. This is my immune system turning on and being activated by this vaccine. And remember, it takes two weeks after the second dose on the two dose regimen um, vaccines before your body will build the immunity it needs. So if you get exposed to the virus between the first and the second shot, 
you're not fully immune. So for all those people that are holding out, you're trying to get together for Thanksgiving, you need to begin your first shot now because it's going to take about, you know, four to five weeks before you're fully immune. So I, now I'm just going to go over some of the things that I hear in my office all the time. So one of the big, big ones I hear, this is just too rushed for me. I need to do more research. So it's not rushed. Like I said before, we've known about coronavirus type um, viruses, you know, for 10 years. They've been developing uh, vaccines, these mRNA vaccines over the last decade. And so as soon as they found out the structure of uh, COVID-19, they were very quickly able to develop um, these specific vaccines. And within two weeks, they, were, they had these vaccines in development. Um, each one of these manufacturers had 40,000 um, people in their studies. Um, and they watch those people for safety and effectiveness over an eight month period. I found, I called myself a guinea pig because I got it done in December. We are now another eight to nine months following that. At one point in the United States, a million people were getting this vaccine in a day. So how much more information, how many more people need to get this vaccine before you're convinced that it is safe and effective. Um, so um, again, you see your physician as an expert. You know, I would never go and watch YouTube and try to change the brakes on my car. You know, you have to have faith that your medical professionals have done the research. They've taken the time to learn about the vaccines, its effectiveness, and its risks to you. You know, discuss with them any kind of um, um, hesitancy you may have, and they will answer any question. You know, that's what we do. That's, that's part of what we're there for. So you don't need to do your own research. I don't understand how brakes and cars work. And I wouldn't expect you to understand necessarily how vaccines work. And so trust your medical professionals and ask and ask. Um, all right, let's see, let's go to the next thing. Next thing I hear. Oh, these vaccines contain microchips. You know, I, I've heard this one before actually in my office and I just say, hey, you know, Bill Gates has better ways to track you. That little phone that she said that sits closer to you than your spouse in the bed, that phone that you have, you know, glued to your head all day long is a much better way to track you than putting a microchip inside of a vaccine. Uh, this vaccine may affect my fertility. Early on, I've heard many people say that the spike protein that's on the uh, virus is similar to the spike protein um, that's seen in the placenta, and that's going to cause early, um, early um, um, uh, have issues uh, with fertility later on uh, for women in life. And, you know, there's no evidence that this is true. Um, again, the spike protein is on the virus. So if you get the virus, it's going to affect your fertility either way, right? So, I mean, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, the vaccine is, the, its whole purpose is to create um, antibodies to the virus, um, but that's not going to last forever. So, um that 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 whole uh, vaccine affecting my fertility doesn't make a whole lot of sense when right now we're dealing with a global pandemic and you're dealing with something that may uh, that may very well kill and hurt you right now. Um, let's see right here. What I got next? Oh, not me. That vaccine will alter my DNA. Well, um, these vaccines are the the first. All of them um, use messenger RNA. They are, do, are taken into the cell, but they do not go into the nucleus of the cell. They're not changing your DNA. You are gonna still be who you were before you got that vaccine. There's nothing changing about who you are because of the vaccine. Vaccines don't even work that way. Um, so one thing that I keep saying over and over again, 
please remember you've been getting vaccines your whole life. Um, when you were children, you took vaccines for things you didn't even know what they what they were for. You, I bet you took your children to get vaccinated and you didn't know what they were for. Vaccines are vital for allowing humans to be able to live together. Part of the reason why we are able to live like we like we do and not have these global outbreaks. Um, why we don't have the shortened lifespan that we had in the past is because of vaccines. We get vaccinated, vaccinated for smallpox, measles, mumps. Those things have been eradicated because of vaccines. Um, our parents um, got the polio vaccine as children. Why? Because polio was ravaging the, the world. Um, causing um, debilitating uh, diseases in kids. And because of the polio vaccine, that has been virtually eradicated. So we're not going to get to the point where we can live the way that we have in the past until we have at least 75% of people vaccinated. So if we want to get back to living our best life again. We've got to get more people engaged, more people vaccinated. And then my last one, and I hear this all the time, why get the vaccine if you can still get the virus anyway? Well, you know, vaccines are not 100%. And as long as our numbers are this high, we're going to still produce variants. And, um, and there's a, 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 there's a likelihood that you could possibly still get the virus. But what we found is that it is almost 100% effective at decreasing severe COVID-19 symptoms and hospitalization. So 85% of the people that are being hospi hospitalized at this time with COVID-19 have not been vaccinated. And that is an testament to the effectiveness of, um, of this vaccine, even with variants. So um, I, I've had some more things to say, but I know that I'm getting really, really tight on time. And I know there's a lot of questions probably still out there. So I'm going to cut it off here. All right, Dr. Carter, thank you so much for that informative piece of work right there. Appreciate it very much. Dr. Abelard, again, that was a sensational uh, presentation by both of you. Uh, now I just want to give our audience an opportunity to uh, you know, connect with the experts and really get a chance to get any questions that they have answered directly in the Q&A section. Um, and again, I want to remind everybody, the best question will receive a prize. Um, so please get the questions going as quickly as you can. We are running a little bit short on a time. So we have about uh, five to 10 minutes approximately. And, uh, you know, please shoot those questions off as soon as you get a chance. And as we wait, I'll just throw one out there myself. Um, uh, does it matter, and this is to you, uh, Dr. Carter, does it matter which vaccine I choose? the brand, Pfizer, Moderna, et cetera, does it matter which one? Do you suggest any specific or what? Yes, um, what we've said in the past, whichever one is most, avail is most readily available to you, I think is gonna be the best one for you. Um, Again, the Pfizer vaccine is the one, the only one that is available for people between 12 and 18 years old. So that may be a part of your decision-making process. But other than that, all of these are effective um, and very, very, very well tolerated. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Dr. Abelard, I got a question for you. Uh, you know, a lot of division and a lot of stress has come on with the conversation about vaccines and unvaccinated people versus vaccinated people. Um, can you just, and I know personally, people in marriages getting broken up for uh, different beliefs. Can you just share uh, your perspective on how you would approach these conversations about vaccines and, you know, just best case scenario on how to kind of engage in the world where everybody is, is such a divisive and controversial question? 
Well, you know, I think that conversation always has to start with oneself and trying to understand why someone feels the way they feel. You know, that was a big piece why it was important. I know for myself and probably Dr. Carter as well to come on tonight to talk about this because I think we all have um, different information that we've received and trying to understand where that comes from. You know, back when I did um, couples counseling, one of the things that I would say to couples is in order for you to work, you have to understand where each person is coming from and then learn how to talk each other's language. And so I think that's an important piece whenever you're talking to anyone about anything is really trying to understand their perspective. And once you do that, I think you're better able to learn what's the best way or what information that is lacking or needed to express or help them understand um, better what other choices are out there in terms of making changes. Uh, amazing, amazing answer. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Carter, uh, can you just expand a little bit on the booster shot and is that required and where are we in terms of that? Um, my my understanding is basically just today, um, the FDA has approved uh, for booster shots for the um, for the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so we do recommend at at eight months following the first vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine, um, a booster for those that are at higher risk. Um, I think at, at some point it will be for all, but at this point is for those at higher risk, so people older than 65 or who have um, some kind of um, chronic medical disease. So um, as, as it pertains to Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, there's still research um, regarding boosters. So boosters only for Pfizer at this time and for those who are at higher risk. And that's at eight months following the first shot. Thank you so much. Um, so I got a question from the chat. Uh, there's a couple, so I'll just start with this one. How many times can I get the virus? Uh, doesn't my body develop a natural immunity to virus once I survive infection? And that's from an anonymous uh, person. Yes, so um, actually I've had a patient that's had it three times. So it is quite possible to get the, the, the virus more than once. Um, the natural immunity does wane over time. Um, we know at least three months, likely fully eight months. Um, that was the reason why initially the boosters for the um, vaccine were recommended at eight months. But um, so your natural immunity does wane over time. We do find that the vaccine is actually more effective at producing um, antibodies and the immune response than the actual virus itself. So the vaccine is more immunogenic, um, can we say, than the actual virus. So, but I do have patients that have had it multiple times and the one that I've had the most is three. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, and then we have another question from one of the panelists who is, you know, trying to, you know, navigate through all of the misinformation out there. Just wants a little bit more clarity on how you could be so certain about the information about the vaccines, as well as why are there so many options for the vaccine? Doesn't that mean some people are going to get ineffective or cheaper ones versus more effective ones? And uh, just wants more clarity on that question. I mean, Any one of you could grab that. I mean, why are there options of hand lotion? I mean, they're, they're you know, because you have different manufacturers that initially um, attempted to create a vaccine. So there's many different ways to solve a problem. Um, 
like I said, the first two, Moderna and Pfizer, both use this mRNA type vector. Um, and then Johnson & Johnson chose a different vector, which is the adeno, uses a adenovirus to um, go into the cell. And so they just work a little bit differently. As you notice, each one of them has a little bit different profile. Um, some can be stored, um, have to be stored in a sub-zero freezer. Some have to be stored, can be stored in a refrigerator. Um, the Johnson & Johnson, if frozen can last for two years, while the Pfizer um, may not, you know, has to be distributed fairly quickly. So you, you notice if you're in a space in a small town clinic, you know, maybe Johnson & Johnson will be more available there because they don't have to have the sub-zero freezer. So each, and you, you could imagine also in a country that does not have sub, you know, has, has limited uh, access to sub-zero freezers, how a Johnson and Johnson vaccine would be, um, be, 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 be a better choice for that, that facility, that, that country. And so each one of them has its, it has has things about them that make them um, uh, better to be used in, in a different um, different settings. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, we are running very, very, very short on time. Um, thank you, everybody who shared their questions. Thank you, everybody for attending. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carter. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for an incredible presentation on a very important. Uh, very controversial topic. Um, and again, I wanna just give a special thanks to Councillor Ken Clifton and his efforts in Randolph for uh, trying to get as many people vaccinated and we are partnering up with him on that. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned before, there'll be a prize. Um, Ahmed Lindsay is the only one who identified themselves with the question. So please reach out to the chamber. Uh, we have $50 in Bitcoin for you as well as uh, 1804, the Haitian history of, uh, the history of hidden history of Haiti will go to you as well. And in closing, I just wanna say, uh, God bless everybody, stay safe, um, take care of yourself and uh, appreciate your time again. And again, great presentation, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you all, be well.